some degree has been underplayed. Um, I might even say it's been somewhat overlooked because we're so familiar with it that I think we lose didn't put enough in it like I used to. Because for some reason we think that we become a little more than what we really are. And we try to do a little more than what we really can do. So we relent from doing what we should do, what we did do, and what Essential is called prayer. For a lot of us, prayer has um, become quite dormant. It's become quite routine. It's something that we do because, oh yeah, we got prayer. Or, oops. limited to just blessing our table food. Sometimes we got to remind, be reminded to do that. We're so interested in what's on the food. Yeah, what's on the table, I'm sorry, that we forget who put the food on the table. Um, so we, we kind of throw it in there because some of us look at it like a good luck charm. You know, you just kind of rub on it when you're in trouble and then we say something to God. Some of us even view it like the national anthem at a football game. It's nice to do, but it has nothing to do with the game. But I I um I began to wonder in my own life what happened. What was it that made it take second place or, you know, become down on the list of necessity and priority? Such other things, but, you know, I, I thought it started to wonder, and why am I sometimes, when I did what I did, I did it, but it was kind of cold. You know, there was no kind of residual feeling or emotion behind what I did. Um, I just went through it like it was part of my life. It was roped by ropes. And um, I, I uh, think that there, 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 there may be others here this morning like I was. Um, you don't have to admit it, it's okay. Um, I'll be the guinea pig. Um, but I, I, I think sometimes it, just because of stuff that um, encroaches upon our lives and seeks to distract or de you know, distract us from doing what we know we're not only supposed to do, but you ought to want to do. Because the, the truth of the matter is, uh, if you can allow me to give a small definition of a complex subject. And it's a large subject, but um, uh, I remember one of the preachers, I heard him say, I can't remember which preacher it was, but I heard him say that prayer is relational conversation with God. The emphasis is on relational. Um, because
because anybody can go through the road. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and so much so that Jesus talked about prayer. Yeah, you know, it was after the ministry. And, um, I'm not going there. I'm going to get there in a minute. Y'all just walk with me. For a he, 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 he talked about it in Matthew uh, 6. And he was talking about how that uh, he used these terms. He was talking to his disciples and those that were close to him. He says, when you pray. Come on, God. Yeah. And throughout the whole five or six verses, four, three or four verses, he kept saying, when you pray. So it was making a contrast from the you and the them. Um, because when he said, when you pray, don't you do it like them. And so um, the issue is that prayer has been a known issue that took place for years. And, and, and Jesus zeroes in about the subject matter of prayer and he makes a distinction. He says now, when you pray, you ought not do this like when they pray. So, so anybody can pray. But that doesn't mean they're going to be heard. So, 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 so Jesus said, you can go to the ritual. He says, when you pray, don't you do it, you know, for public applause. You know, they do it on the corners and synagogue. He wasn't against public prayer. No, no, he was against applause from people about the way you pray. And he says they get their reward. And their reward is this, what the people gave them. And that was public applause. That's all that they got for it. And he said, but when you do it, go into your closet and shut the door. And you dialogue with your heavenly father. What he was saying to them and to us is that the reason why you shut the door because it's a relational conversation that you have between you and God. Yeah, he's also said when you pray, don't be using a whole lot of words like Gentiles do. Unbelievable. They, they they use you know and don't 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 look at me funny like we can't fall into that. I've been in church for over forty years. Got some mileage on me now, and I've seen some things and I've heard some things. And I've heard I've heard I remember way back in the year of our Lord. I remember you know certain. Preachers and certain deacons, we used to ask to pray. It, it was automatic, instant, yeah. and you knew what was going to come out of their mouth while they were praying. Okay, well, sorry. Our gracious Father, come on, God. Your humble servant comes, bow head and bend knee. We just come this morning to thank you for touching us with the finger of your love and waking us up this morning. We want to say thank you for allowing our golden moments to roll on just a little bit longer.
now we ask, Lord, that you would look over here, over there. Go touch Sister So and So, Brother So and So, and touch the children over there. Look over here, my pastor, Lord, and watch over him and his family uh, because you have been good and use him to do what it is that you want to use him to do. And Lord, now when we go out, when we come in to go out, when our bed becomes our cooling board, sheets become our winding sheets. When our tongues clean through the roof of our eyes, and our eyes go back in our head. We're going on the way Joe declared that the wicked will cease from trouble and the weary will be at rest. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Two weeks later, you asked him to come up and pray. And here comes your humble servant down here. Amen. Same old stuff. Jesus calls that vain repetition. It's a whole lot of words out of the mouth, but that's not what is really come from. Memorize, but wrong motivation. And he said, don't you do that like they do that. Did you know what blew the dust off of the dormancy of prayer in my life is when I read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, I think verse 17, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. Yeah, right, and so that made me think about some things, which is, you know, how do I pray without ceasing? And the way that that is deduced, uh, the way that you can come to that conclusion is because you can't limit prayer to form. Body and hands. Because most of us think that you can't pray without seeing. You know, without ceasing. How you pray without ceasing? You gotta drive, you gotta walk. Well, who says you gotta have your eyes closed to pray? So you don't have to have your eyes closed to pray. Matter of fact, sometimes Jesus said you gotta watch and pray you know, at the same time. So so it's not to form, it's, it's not to you know, I can't be on my knees all day long. No, prayer does not have to be by any, you know, posture of your body. No, what, what, to, uh, it, it, this is how I, I came to understand it. If you would allow me, I'm not doing uh, injustice to the text. But, on, but, but you, you could replace the word prayer with breathe. Okay, this is how we read. Breathe without ceasing. So, so let me ask you this. How many of you woke up this morning and said, I'm tired of breathing? <laughs> Matter of fact, after service, I'm so tired of breathing, I'm not going to breathe after the benediction. And, and see how far you get. You know, nobody woke up this morning and said, Whew, I've been sleeping all night long. I'm just tired of breathing this morning. I'm, I'm going to breathe it on lock for a minute so that I can go do what I need to do. No, no, see, breathing is necessary because your life depends on it. So if you breathe without ceasing, Paul was saying, you ought to pray without ceasing because you're Life depends on that You and I can't make it without breathing. No more can a Christian make it without praying. I mean, you got to pray while you're at play. You got to pray while you're in leisure. You got to pray. You can, that's the blessedness about it. You can talk to God anywhere, anytime. Anyway, I mean, you, you just can talk to him like he's right there, and he is. He really is. He he, he said that he, he's gonna live on the inside of us. You know, he said, "I'm I'm, I'm checking out. I'm going to tell y'all deuces. I'm leaving." But he says, "I'm gonna leave another comforter." 
called the word another in the Greek means another of the same kind. Like me. Not a different one than me. Just like me. He's going to live in you. Now, he's living with you, but now he's going to live in you. And then Paul picks it up later and says, even when you don't know what to pray for, the one that's living in you, he makes groanings and utterances and uh, intercessions that can't be uttered. Now, to somebody, you know, I mean, you know, some of my Pentecostal brothers and sisters, they took that verse to say, see, this is your prayer. <laughs> but the text says, he makes groans that can't be uttered. So if you are uttering your prayer language, that ain't prayer language. That's you doing the other thing. The reason why he does the interceding and the intercession is because we don't know sometimes what to pray for. But he does. Have you ever received something that you may have thought or have you received something that you didn't know you needed it until you got it? I just want to let you know it wasn't because you asked for it. It was because he knew what you needed and he knew how to say it. And he told it to God. On your behalf and on my behalf. So, so, so this whole issue of prayer, it kind of, you know, regalvanized. What it did was it took for me, to me, it was a, a dormant prayer life to a dynamic prayer life. And, 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 this is, and, this is, and this is the verse I want to share with you. Lord, have mercy, I did that about 10 minutes. I, I want to share with you uh, this verse that hopefully it, it will blow the dust off of your prayer life. Hopefully it will literally make that which is dormant to become dynamic. Because of this passage, I'm telling you, this passage got my goat, man. This passage made me feel like running when nobody was chasing me. This passage made me wave my hand and nobody was waving back. I'm not going to lie. This passage made me laugh when it wasn't nothing funny. It, it is this passage in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. I just want to lift these three, four verses, two, three verses up, and then I'm going to take my seat, if you help me. Are you with me? Hebrews chapter 4. I hope this, Sharon, will help us and to help us to, to move to another level of knowing the urgency and the importance and how essential this privilege that you and I have to pray. I pray that it makes you want to pray. As a matter of fact, if you want to tag the text, I'm going to talk about an invitation to pray. An invitation to pray. He, he says this, this is NIV version. He says, that therefore, verse 14 of chapter 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Somebody say every way. Just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Authorized version says, come boldly to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. I promise you, I will stay right here. And we're going to walk through that. I want to show you four things, or at least four things, that will hopefully help you to, to turn your dormant prayer life into a dynamic prayer life. All right, all right, sir. And it's interesting that in the book of Hebrews, in the fourth chapter, 
The problem with the Hebrew Christians that have just been converted from Judaism to Christianity, they begin to fall back and draw back from the new faith that they have found mm -hmm. because of persecutions and things of that nature and families distancing themselves from them and dissing them and you know, putting them out and writing them off as dead because they haven't accepted Christ. And so, you know, they, they were going through and they started to wonder if they made the right choice in life. Did, did, did choosing Jesus, was that what I should have done? Was that the right choice to do? Or, or should I go back to what I left because I, I'm really being persecuted, misunderstood, and now I'm busted, disgusted, I, I, and other people think I can't be trusted. So, so, so they were contemplating going back to that which Christ had converted them from. So the Hebrew writer says, no, don't draw back, draw me. And he says, you need to know that the reason why you ought to draw near is because God's word will cut you open. He knows the very motivation of your heart. And everything is naked before him in whom we have to give an account. He says, so there's no need to be fearful or fretful. No need to be shy or embarrassed. He says, no, God sees everything. And because he sees everything, verse 14, therefore, Lord have mercy. He says, because God sees everything, if you look at verse 12, 13, he tells you that. And God knows everything, 12, 14, he says, based on that, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Now, the first reason he tells us why we ought to pray, y'all walking with me, is because of the position of Christ. Where's that at? That's in the very first verse. He says, Christ has gone through the heavens. Now, now you have to compare that to the earthly priest's ministry because they had to go through three phases to get to God. You remember the tabernacle? I know I'm in Bible right? You remember the tabernacle and even the temple that they had an outer court? Then they had the inner court. They had the holy place and the holy of holies. And the outer court, come on. The people would gather there, the priests would receive their sacrifices then they would go to the inner court. Y'all yeah. walking with me? Yeah. And in the inner court, you remember it, it was the altar of incense, it was the table of showbread, and it was the altar um, with a lampstand, the golden lampstand where the lights, uh, where the candles were lit, so that each of those things represented something about Christ. It was a type of what Christ did, his priestly ministry. He said, therefore, since we have a great high priest, so he's referring back to what the priests were and who this priest is that we have now. So the priest had to take the sacrifice from the outer court, come to the inner court, altar of incense, the golden lampstand, the table of showbread that was in the holy place. And each of them represented Christ. For when they walked in, the aroma of the prayers or the incense that burned on the altar of incense was the aroma of the prayers, perpetual praying of the saints, for the saints, constantly around the clock, which talked about the high priesthood of Christ. He always makes intercession for you. And the lampstand was, they had to have light while they were ministering. Jesus came and said, I'm the light of the world. And they got weary while they were ministering. The bread, table, showbread, they would go and eat. It was regalvanized and revived. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So, so whatever it is that you need, light in darkness, somebody praying for you all the time, and when you need strength on the journey, it's all that and some and a bag of chips. But then they would have to go to the Holy of Holies, and it wasn't the priest, it was only one, the high priest. 
he had to go into the Holy of Holies. You know, Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was inside the Ark of the Covenant, was the rod that budded, the Aaron's rod. It was a, a, a bronze, a bronze um, pot there with bread in it, and there was the Ten Commandments. The tables were in there, and on top of it was two angels. Uh, two angels facing each other, and that on top of that was called the mercy seat. Yes. And what the priest would have to do when he came in to the Holy of Holies, you, you know, he had to sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat because when God descended in the Shekinah glory, he saw the law, and the law reminded him of the sinfulness of man. And his wrath would be infuriated to the point that he wanted to wipe everybody out. But when the blood that was shed, that was covering it, God subsided from his wrath and he winked at the sin of man until the real blood that was going to be shed for all men would be done. But, but he had to go through three phases the, outer court, the, the, the Holy of Holies, Holy, Holy of Holies, and outside the outer court. The, 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 the Bible says Christ went through the heavens. Now, now, now that, that was the first heaven that's down here. The, the second heaven was the moon, the stars, the galaxies. The third heaven is the very presence of God, which is heaven. So, so, so just as the priests went through those phases to get to God, Christ went through those phases to be in the very presence of God. See, y'all missed it. The point that I'm trying to make to you, the reason why you and I ought to pray is because Christ has access and he is in the very presence of God. And you want somebody that's not on the outskirts of God or closer to God. You want somebody in the very presence of God to be able to represent you and me. Yeah. This made me want to pray because of the position of Christ. But, but this verse also says something else. This verse tells us that we ought to want to pray because of the person. It says it right there, that he is Jesus, the Son of God. Y'all see that? that? That's still in verse number 14. He said, the reason why you and I ought to pray is because of not only his position, but because of his person. Now, I'm going to drop some stuff on you. I know you know this. Some of you do. Some of you may not. Now, don't, 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 don't turn me off because... It's a lot of truth in this verse. He, he says, the reason why we ought to pray is because of the person of Christ. Well, what does it say about the person of Christ? He's Jesus. That's his human name. He's the son of God. That's his divinity. Jesus is where we get the Hebrew name Joshua. It means salvation of the Lord. But Jesus is his human name. And his human side. But the Son of God is his divine side. So in his name, it's both humanity and divinity. What does that got to do with anything to make me want to pray? I'm telling you, it ought to make you want to pray. Because you have somebody that not only has the right position in the presence of God, but you have somebody to be able to represent you that knows both sides of the story. He knows the human side because he became flesh and dropped among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But yet on the divine side, he's the son of God, which means this. He can represent me from the human perspective and say to God, now it don't look like that they can make it because I understand what that looks like from their perspective. But I know who you are, so you can do for them what they can't do for themselves, so I can represent them by understanding them as human, but I also gonna represent them for you because you are divine. So whenever humanity fails, divinity is there to 
promise you, I believe the Lord. But, but you ought to, I ought to want to pray not only because of the position of Christ, not only because of the person of Christ, but thirdly because of the passion of Christ. It's right here in the same verse. In the next verse he says, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to take my seat, y'all. If this don't ring your bell, you're clapping. It's something wrong. It's something wrong. It's really something wrong. Because he says this. We all don't want to pray because of Christ's position. He's right in the presence of God. We all don't want to pray because of Christ's person. He understands both sides of the story. But we ought to want to pray even more because of his passion. And that is this. He has been tempted in every way. Just like you and me. Which suggests that he's able to feel what I feel. We all know that God knows everything. Can you agree? That He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows everything about everything. He knows everything. He knows. Everything. He, knows. he sees. He knows everything. But but you know, there's a difference between knowing and experiencing. Don't, don't, don't turn it off because I'm going to uh, sound a little heretical for some of you, but, but, but don't turn me off. Don't turn me off. Don't know I ain't no heretic. Just walk with me for a few minutes. And that is this. Do you know and do you believe that God does know everything? He knows everything about sin. He knows everything about temptation. He knows everything about hurts. He knows everything about tears, but he has not. There are some things that God can't experience. What do you mean? God can't experience. Yes, there's some things that God can't experience. And one of them is found in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He says, let no man say when he is tempted of God that God is tempting him. He says, God tempts no man. Neither can God be tempted. Meaning that there's nothing in God that draws him into the touchy-feely level of temptation. God can't be tempted. So he can only know that, but he can't feel it. So what God did to help him feel what he knows and to back up what he knows by what he feels is that he sent his son and put him in human form and he was able to be subject to temptation at every level that you and I are tempted about so that when he goes back to glory and now he's representing you and me, we can really tell what it is that we feel and he can tell God what it is that he feels and what it is that you feel and I feel because he went through 
Because I got somebody that feels me. He knows just how I feel when all of these things in life happen to me. He knows how I feel. You have been lied on before? You have been falsely accused before? He, he knows how it feels when folk dagger you. He know how that is. Judas did it to him. Oh, y'all not talking back to him. He knows what it feels like when you are rejected and you have not done anything wrong to be rejected. He knows how that feels when you blackball. Lord have mercy. Because somebody else is jealous of you. Or somebody else has issues with you. And they want everybody else to have their issues. Make their, their issues your issue. He knows how that feels. Because it was done to him. That makes me want to pray. Because of his position. Because of his person. But also because of his passion. He knows how I we feel. Lord have mercy. Last but not least, I'm done. I'm going to say deuces and not listen. He says, fourthly, the reason why you and I ought to pray is not only because of his position, not only because of his person, not only because of his passion, but last but not least, you and I ought to pray because of his provision. <laughs> He says right there, verse number 16, let us, because of him that is able to feel, to feel you, let us come with confidence. Let us come boldly. Throw your head up. Square your shoulders. Speaks of rule, reign, and authority. We have somebody that's in his presence and in their position knows how we feel with his passion. He says, Come on in. Come on, man. The throne room. So that you might understand that this is a throne room of grace. That you might find some mercy and grace. To help you in the time of your need. Why do I need grace and mercy to help me? Because if he knows my passion, he knows my passion sometimes is filled with flaw. And if I'm flawful in my passions, I need some provision to help me in the areas that I need help in. I need both grace and I need mercy because of someone having access to both. Let me see if I can help you. I'm going to take my seat. My sisters and my brothers, but understand this. Uh, I, I was invited downtown to this um, real high political event. And uh, I took my two guys with me back then. It was uh, Deacon Chuck and Minister Ed Carpo. They went with me. And so we walked up to the first door. And when we got to the first door, they checked and see who I was. You know, who, who are you? I told them the name was on the thing. They said, okay, you coming. And I went to walk in. And two, they were behind me. I said, oh, excuse me, sir. They're with me. They said, okay. All right, you go ahead. You're with him. So I went through and went down the hallway, got to another set of guards there, and they said, yes, who are you? I told them who I was. They looked on that, oh, okay, yeah, you can go. And I went to walk through, and the guys was like kind of standing in front. I said, oh, no, 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 stay with me. And, and they said, oh, okay, you can go through. By the time I got to the third door, they must have called ahead of time, ready to hold up. I said, this little short black preacher is coming down there and he's wearing a such a suit on and uh, he's got two guys with him. So when I got there, they said, oh, you must be 
Mr. Reed, no. I said, yes, sir. Yes, I am. He said, oh, go right on in. I went through that door. Do you believe I had to go through another door with a set of guards there to get to the person that I needed to get to? And by the time I got there, I told them my name. They must have walked in their ear. And they said, oh, okay, yeah, come on. You come in. And then I turned around. And I said, they with me. And they came on in with me. And finally, we got to the place that we was desiring to get to. I'm just simply saying that we have been, Christ has been authentic. See, he's been authorized. So therefore, wherever he goes and wherever he is, you and I have access. We have access to the throne of grace. But mercy keeps from you what you do deserve. So we got both on both ends. So when I mess up and I falter and I fail, I can go to God and ask for some grace. And he'll give it to me even if I don't deserve it. And then he'll give me some mercy to stay back what I do deserve based upon what I did. And y'all sitting here acting like God ain't said something. You ought to pray because we got a whole throne room full of grace. I understand now what the parents used to say when they had prayer. They said when stuff is messing with you, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell them all about your troubles. He'll hear your humble cry. He'll answer. change. 
But not only do we have feelings. Somewhere 
discussed or talked about and what you think about doing and how you do it. Show me that in here. If you can show me that in there, go in there. But if you can't, set your regular self back. Now Tony said, all the way down. All the way down. And watch God. Watch God. Watch God. Watch God. Jesus. 